Well, welcome back to City Line. With me, I have a very familiar face. You may know him from uh, St. Leo's Food Connection, my friend Kevin Glacken Cooley. He has, he's been my friend and he has been um, one of the best kept secrets of Tacoma for a long time. But he is here today in a different role and we cannot be more delighted to have him. So allow me to introduce him as the Director of Special Projects for Tacoma Pierce County Coalition to End Homelessness. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Amanda. It's lovely to see even part of you. Well, I was just showing you my pajama bottoms. Because yes, I wasn't going to mention that. I, 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 yeah. Well, I, I'm very transparent, so yes, <laughs> I have my, my flannels on because it's it's cold out there. But it it's is. A, uh, it winter is. day. So, Kevin, it seems like there are a lot more people in tents uh, where we can see them. Um, then I usually see, because I live close to Wright Park, mm -hmm. and I'm always kind of looking and I'm and I'm engaging because they are someone's son and daughter. So what is different this year? Is it my imagination or is there more? Well, it's over the last couple of winters, I think, uh, the different municipalities, the city, the county, and others have made a concerted effort to clean up some of the encampments that were underneath highway overpasses or down by the river, other places out of sight. Uh, but while those uh, were cleaned out for you know health, health reasons, there wasn't an alternative for people to go to. So they've moved to literally the streets, or in this case, the sidewalks and the, uh, the right-of-ways. Uh, so I don't know that there's a marked increase in the number of folks living on the streets. It's just that they're more visible, uh, at least the folks who are in tents. There's also then that whole invisible component of folks who live in their vehicles and um, you know they will park in one place one day and another place another day um, and that where and that's where you tend to find more of the families are it's still in a vehicle because they're trying to keep their kids as safe as possible so yeah oh so Kevin I I mentioned it was a, a crisp winter morning um, and frosted last night and as I was going to bed I thought about uh, warming shelters. I thought about people who don't have blankets and don't mm -hmm. have coats, who are houseless. Um, why is the coalition so focused on a winter shelter? Well, it's always an issue of concern, even though our weather is relatively temperate. When you get into the winter months, you start getting rain and colder weather. And I mean, technically, inclement weather starts at 32 degrees, but if you're outside and it's 42 degrees and raining, that's still pretty bad. But in the past years, uh, some of the major shelter providers like the Rescue Mission, Nativity House and others would be able to ramp up their capacity. They could uh, double and triple up. They could put mattresses down on the floor in common areas. But in this age of social distancing and with the impacts of the pandemic, they're not able to do that kind of ramp up. So we knew moving into this season that there was gonna be a need for some more creative options uh, to find ways to provide those housing options for people uh, in the winter that would normally be there. Uh, and again, it's uh, winter housing is it's, uh, you know, when the weather's warm, it's still a question of how do we provide safe, secure housing for all those who wish it, uh, but it's more marked in the winter. And so that's why I'm on board now for, you know, from now through the end of April, helping work on winter shelter options. So I was able to attend the coalition's virtual homeless summit earlier this week, over 200 people were on that phone call. Um, it was really amazing. I don't think I've ever experienced uh, something like that. So can you, for those people who could not be on the phone call, um, can you tell us who participated and what do you hope comes out of that event? So the genesis for that was actually an idea that Maureen Howard, who's been involved with the coalition forever had one Sunday night and she called the mayor on Monday morning. And so, and two weeks later we had the summit. Um, so Maureen's made a commitment not to do any more two week turnarounds, but, but it was really trying to recognize that this is a difficult weather season, uh, ex exacerbated by the pandemic. And we really needed to get all the players together in, well, one virtual room. 
to talk about what are the needs and what are the commitments that organizations and individuals can make. So in preparation for the for the meeting, we we just generated a list of uh, asks that uh, agencies and individuals had of other agencies or of funders or of uh, community partners or of local governments saying these are the things we think we need in order to get from now until the end of the winter season with nobody dying on our streets. And part of what was the impetus for it is we had set ourselves the lofty goal of no one dying unsheltered this winter. And in November, four unsheltered people died. Uh, and then several more in December, including the incident at the encampment at 6th and M where there was a shooting. Uh, and so it was just really like we need to get everyone in, in one virtual room to start talking about it. So for those who weren't there, it was, uh, it was tightly scripted, uh, but it was uh, individuals and the different organizations and different. So we talked about in healthcare and need for physical space and the need for funding. Here are the things that we need. And then some agencies had already been able to commit to some of those things. Uh, but our plan is to come back in three weeks and use this interim period over the holidays to really uh, find out who can commit to doing these different things and getting them into place as soon as possible so we can uh, provide shelter opportunities for those in need during the winter. Beautifully said for people who unfortunately could not make that phone call. Yeah, and I think that it's, uh, I th and I, I think maybe they'll, you'll be airing it later. It is um, archived and you can watch it uh, virtually. Uh, so that link is available either if you come to the coalition website or I think Fred might be putting it up on screen at some point. He probably is. So Kevin, in your opinion, given the heavy hitters that were on that phone call. What is the city or county doing about homeless? Well, I think if you look at the city and county uh, and, all, uh, and all sorts of providers, people have been doing what they can. But there's, I think, a real sense of need to say, what can we do concerted working together? And what's what's the role for the city? What's the role for the county? What's the role for the philanthropic community? What's the role for service providers? So that we can create a system that is uh, works efficiently for those experiencing homelessness. So like one of the asks we had, for instance, in the summit was that nobody would be discharged from hospitals directly to the street. Very simple request. It requires a lot of different moving pieces to get organized together in terms of do the hospitals know who to connect? Is there a list of where the active beds are? All those kinds of things. So it was really a chance to say, Everybody here is concerned. We're all working on this issue, and there's people with goodwill, good intent, and how can we make it work more smoothly? Uh, you know, I, my first experience working with folks who were homeless in Tacoma was back in the mid-'80s at Nativity House. In my naivety then, as a 25-year-old, I thought, well, this is a solvable problem, and it's only grown uh, in the years, the decades since then. So clearly, people have been doing good work, but we need to do it more uh, in a more coordinated manner. Kevin, as I sit here and listen to you, it washes over me that many people often assume that most homeless people are drug addicts or mentally ill. From your opinion, given your years of working on this issue, is that true? And if, if it's not true, then who are those who are houseless? So folks who are experiencing homelessness represent kind of a broad swath of the community. Um, there are some things, I mean, 25% of those who are living uh, unhoused in our community are under the age of 18. Um, a lot of times they're still with their family or they've left uh, a difficult family situation and are on their own. A number of folks who are experiencing homelessness may have substance abuse issues or mental health issues, but you, it's hard to know, were those the issues that led them to being homeless or is it the fact that you have to stay up all night to protect your stuff leading and exacerbating those kinds of issues. And so, um, and then if you also look, you know, there are plenty of people who are housed who have mental health issues and substance abuse issues, but they've still got a safety net for them. So I think the first response is that housing is the basic human need uh, beyond food and water. Uh, to be able to have a place where you can close the door and feel safe, you can actually get some real rest. So, you know, I, 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 I same thing as you, I drive by the, the tents on Yakima and other places, and I'm just thinking to myself, you're never, you're never rested, you're never comfortable, you never feel safe, and so there's always this edge there. So whether there was a pre-existing substance abuse or mental health issue, or it's been exacerbated by that, or brought on by this, this current situation, uh, we need to say, you know, 
I always come back to this. We would never want anyone we love to live like that. And so as a community, how can we recognize that these are all our, these are our family members uh, out there and uh, how can we find a way to make them safe? And then beyond that too, it's just, um, there's a lot of cost that goes into kind of managing these kinds of systems and that money could probably use more, be used more effectively to create housing rather than to clean up camps and move people and, and then start all over again. So. So you mentioned something I want to expand upon and, and that is when I am out and about doing my walkabouts and I'm downtown mm -hmm. and I look around and I see these empty buildings um, I know I am not the only person that says, why can't we just use these empty buildings to house the homeless? Yeah, well, I, you're not. I mean, that's a common question from everyone. But then you get into issues of liability of some of the buildings that are abandoned are not in not habitable. <laughs> so it's like how, and so that's one of the things that we're trying to hope will come out of this, uh, this summit is, can we really identify what buildings are available or what apartment buildings have empty spaces? Is there a way of developing a, uh, a, a one-stop place where people can go in and say, okay, I have a family, here's a place with a room. Uh, there's a great program that just started up in Seattle before the, before COVID hit called the uh, uh, housing connector and one of the things and so that's, I think along those lines what we'd like to do here is that we'll be able to work with landlords say you have an empty apartment what would it take for us to be able to move a family with a poor credit history in there what kind of supports would you need them to have because you know this, this, that's their livelihood the landlord um, but and so you want to be able to provide safe housing that's going to last for a while that will meet the needs of the, of the property owners as well Another, you know, one thing that we're looking at, just particularly for this season, uh, is uh, the idea of safe parking network. So identifying spaces where uh, people can park, and not a lot of cars, maybe four or five cars, uh, can park each night and so know that they can go there and they can be safe. They have access to Wi-Fi. A lot of people living in cars have their kids. They're trying to do schoolwork um or just trying to stay connected to the world as they're looking for work for themselves so rather than parking on a on a street by yourself and having to maybe stay awake because you're not sure what the neighborhood's like so can we provide some options like that as well so we're not just saying it's not just we need shelters uh, and then i guess the other thing that's made it difficult this year is with covid it's much more difficult to operate a shelter i mean we're all practicing social distancing we're supposed to keep to our bubbles and then we're talking about having people in a space so that's an added cost it's added staffing um it's made a bad situation worse it has kevin in this in this last 30 seconds we have and this is a, a big question to ask but as our audience is watching and, and are wanting to know what they can do and how they can get involved mm -hmm. what would you say to them well, I would say one is that the coalition is an uh, open table. We meet every Friday. Uh, well, not Christmas Day or New Year's Day, so we'll be meeting again on January 8th. Uh, and it's social, it's uh, service providers, it's individuals in the community, and you go to pchomeless.org and you can get the link to our Friday meetings. Just a chance to get educated about the different options and you find out what your niche is. I think the other thing, provided based on your comfort level, is to is to talk to folks you encounter who are who are experiencing homelessness. I think the worst thing we can do is to ignore them. And the second worst thing we could do is just to presume we know what they need. So, you know, you go to McDonald's and you pick up an extra sandwich and you just drop it off. Well, they, maybe they ate, you know, so we don't know. So how can you have those kinds of conversations? And again, that's exacerbated now. We're not talking to people we know <laughs> uh, because of COVID, but that would be my first thing. Come and, and listen to what the coalition is doing. Uh, and then also just depending on where you are in the county, reach out to the organizations in your community that are doing this kind of work, whether it's the Salvation Army, Catholic Community Services, the Rescue Mission, any number of large and small nonprofits and say, what do you need? Yeah. There we go. You know, Kevin, I would be remiss if I didn't let our audience know that the vast uh, resources that uh, the, the Peers Coalition in Homelessness um, you are their only paid position, and that's a contract position. Yeah. You are their first paid employee, and that means that whole team, as the brilliance that they have, the Garrett Nylands, the Marine Howards, there's so many more I don't have time to right. even acknowledge. They are volunteers. Yeah. So with the great example they set, I hope that anybody who's listening to this mm -hmm. uh, takes your word to heart. 
and decides that they too can volunteer and be a part of the solution. Right, and I would just say, just in, in, in ending that, it's, I, this was true for my years of working in the food banks, the need won't end after Christmas. So January, February, March, there'll still be a need and your gifts and talents will be essential to help it, for us to figure out the solution. Absolutely. Kevin, thank you so much for taking time out of your precious schedule to be here. Um, I'm gonna come chase you again, probably in uh, February and March. And of course, I will be on those phone calls on Friday as well. Excellent. Happy holidays to you and your family. And to you and yours as well.